Uh, I ran to Jesus when I realized I was under God's condemnation, and rightfully so, and I could never get myself out from under it, and that Jesus was offering a free means of escape through faith in him. That was extremely selfish. In fact, Jesus' gospel invitation is, all who are athirst who come to me and drink freely the water of life. That's extremely selfish uh, for me. I'm thirsty. I need living water. Christ has it. And he says, he that cometh unto me, will, I will in no wise cast out. And I ran to him because I was thirsty. And then he said, now that you've been given this water, uh, this, this abundant water, which, which, which uh, not only can you draw from, but it actually flows through you if you'll allow it to. It overflows from you if you'll allow it to. Now, will you be my disciple and give yourself back to me and to the people that I call you to minister to. And that's extremely unselfish, as well as the means by which the person of Jesus Christ is glorified in us. So we can be uh, Christ's image and glorify him through the simple fact that we're saved, or we can do works and say words and think thoughts that glorify and honor him and have more to show for it than just our bare souls when we arrive in heaven. All right, um, to that end, this is not the message. That's rolling, right, Roger? All right, cool. Thank you so much for doing that. I have a couple verses. This is not the message whatsoever, but I felt it necessary to explain why I am wearing this mask. And... Maybe you don't think it is. I just felt it was. Okay. In Luke 13. Luke 13. Start in verse 31, Luke 13, 31. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, that's Jesus, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devil and do, and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Jesus told his disciples and everyone within earshot, Do what the governor tells you to do. But then he blasted him with his mouth. And so I'm telling the governor, that fox, that I'm wearing this magic piece of cloth because he said I had to. And uh, if I plant it in the ground, I assume it'll turn into a silk cord that I can climb up to a giant's house and find a golden goose. Uh, but that's about all it's good for. Um, now, let me also mention... So I'm wearing this to please the governor because he said I had to indoors. I think even if we're by ourselves, if I understand correctly. Uh, in Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 16, I was going to wear a yellow tie this morning, but I realized that a purple shirt plus a yellow tie plus a green mask would equal Mardi Gras, <laughs> and I wasn't too interested in pleasing Ezekiel's before Dan, yeah, in pleasing the governor's, as it were, bosom buddy, the Surgeonet General, uh, because I think Mardi, Mardi Gras colors might have excited him a little too much. Uh, Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Uh, 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. He's talking to Israel. Behold, this was iniquity that I saw, uh, sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty, and committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Uh, took them away meant rain 
fire and brimstone on them, and then they got to go to hell after that. That's what taking them away means. Uh, you notice it was the very last thing God mentioned about Sodom was committing abomination. It began with pride, idleness, and fullness of the bread. Basically, they were proud, uh, lazy, and fat, or proud, fat, and lazy, however that order goes. We're already there. Yeah, proud, fat, and lazy. We're already there as a, as a country. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. You know, that's kind of like, hey, if you're poor and needy, instead of training and educating you about how you can feed yourself and your family, just sit in your house, and we'll give you just enough to survive, and maybe we'll pay for your Wi-Fi so you have something to entertain you while you wait for the next check. That is not strengthening the hand of the poor and needy. In order to have strength, you need to have food, which gives energy, and work, which gives exercise. Okay, we're already there. And then finally, uh, and they were haughty. Okay, we, we won't take rebuke from the, from the scriptures. And committed abomination before me. The very last step before God took them away, bring the fire of hell on them, and then dropped them into the fires of hell, was committing abomination. And so thank you, Surgeon General, for reminding me that the days are short and that God's about to take us away if we don't stand up and preach the truth. Uh, someone, I, I, I'm having a little trouble taking medical advice from someone who can't even look in the mirror and figure out what sex they are. That's just, uh, that's just me personally. I think it's just a little common sense. And if it sounds a little harsh, it's because the days are short and I don't have time to fool around and answer to God for why I soft pedaled the truth and the gospel when all this wickedness was happening around. Okay, now let's get to the message. Governor, I'm so diligent about tightening this thing up so it chokes me. Let's take it off. <laughs> Acts chapter. Now, by the way, I pray that the governor and the surgeon general come to the same knowledge of Jesus Christ and he puts them into their right mind. But in the meantime, I'm going to cry against wickedness. Uh, that's why we don't have prayer in schools. We have abortion and all kind of wickedness in our, in our culture because very few people took time to cry against it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 9. Now, this is the aftermath of Paul's conversion, beginning in Acts chapter 9, verse 19. This is after he uh, came to Ananias' house. Ananias prayed over him. He was given back his sight, and he arose and was baptized in verse 18. When he had received meat, he was uh, strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. When someone claims conversion, the only way to know for sure what's happening, because we can't see the heart the way God can, is to look at the fruit. What do they do as a result of having come to Christ? I remember David Jeremiah one time preaching on the supposed conversion of pornographer Larry Flint. And he said that he knew instantly that it was a false conversion or just a hoax. And Larry Flint himself came out later and said it was a hoax, that he had never come to Christ. He had never been saved. And because and David Jeremiah said he could not have continued to, uh, to publish and peddle the filth that he had before after having come to Christ. And so when he's producing a rotten fruit, you know that there's nothing new. There's nothing fresh. There's nothing sweet on the inside. And likewise, Saul. Remember, Ananias had some protests to God when, when God uh, told him to go and get Saul and receive him into his home and pray for him. He said, this is the fellow that, that's killing and imprisoning and scourging and otherwise torturing your people, followers of your way. He said, and he told Ananias, I have great things for him to do and to suffer. He, uh, he, he's one of us now, basically. He, he's your brother. And the only way for us to know from the outside looking in is to look at the fruit. 
I was excited uh, when I heard, that, uh, you know, well, first of all, you know, the Con Kanye West conversion and his gospel CD, that's cute. But what's he doing now? Is he continuing in the faith? Is he continuing to give God the glory? Is he continuing uh, to walk as a disciple of Jesus? Is he continuing to walk humbly before God and bless the people around him? I don't know. I'm just asking those questions. I was excited because when I grew up, there was this band called Corn, spelled with a K, and uh, about uh, 2006 or 7, one of their lead guitar players, Brian Welch, uh, had, was converted and came to faith in Jesus Christ, and he went over to Africa and started and opened an orphanage. That's wonderful. Uh, now, under the uh, tutelage of uh, who I would claim is a false teacher, Todd White, he's back in the band Corn and playing songs and singing songs that glorify sin, glorify wickedness, that glorify pride, that glorify depression and suicide, and otherwise things that have nothing to do with the true and living God. And so either he backslid, he was saved, and backslid into his old life, just like Peter who was saved, and then as soon as Jesus was gone for a few days, he said, I'm going fishing. Because absent the power and presence of Jesus Christ, that's all I know how to do. Perhaps Brian Welch was, in a sense, deflated of the power and presence of the Spirit. Not that he lost his salvation, but uh, is, uh, is backslidden into it, uh, not being in the presence of Christ. And not soaking in the grace of God, and not soaking in the Word of God, and not being convicted by the Spirit of God. All he knows to do is go back to what he knew before. Or he was never really saved. Okay? Watch the fruits. That's how you know the conversion's true. It says, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And the scripture says that no man can say Jesus is the Son of God except by the Holy Spirit. There's your evidence. Okay. Uh... He continued to preach in the synagogue. He spoke in Damascus in verse 27 in the name of Jesus. He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. Uh, but they went about to slay him. So he's not even scared of adversity in the face of uh, harm and death. There's some, there's some evidence. And it says in verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Here's what God does. I, I don't understand why or how or how it all works together. But he sends out champions who, in a sense, absorb the persecution and the kickback and the opposition and the... Uh, argument and then because they're taking all that the church has rest I thank God for champions like Billy Sunday like D.L. Moody like Charles Spurgeon like uh, Jack Hiles in the 20th century like uh, William Tyndale in the 14th or 15th century the 15th century like Martin Luther in the 16th century who were the lightning rods for persecution and opposition uh, and all kinds of accusations and all kinds of tortures and torments and in some cases death but because of them the churches had rest were able to follow after Jesus Christ I'm thankful to Paul for being one of those champions who absorbed and became the, the focal point for that persecution so that the churches around could have rest now, let's go forward to chapter 13. And beginning in verse 42. Chapter 13 and, 40, and verse 42. And when the Jews were going out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Uh, so that is, they were in the synagogue, proclaiming Christ as the Son of God, proclaiming His death, burial, and resurrection, 
as the only way that men could be saved, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Gentiles also overheard this, or some of them were in the synagogue, and they said, would you come back and preach to us next Sabbath? And that's what often uh, Paul and the other missionaries would do. They would go into the synagogues, because these were places where people were already gathering, and uh, where you had a, a, a built-in audience, and often they were willing to let outsiders and, and newcomers speak. They wanted to say, or hear, what new thing did someone from the outside coming in have to offer? And so they would go to these synagogues, and they would preach during the Jewish service, and then after the, the, the Jewish uh, Israelite peoples had left, the Gentiles would stay behind, and they would continue preaching to the Gentiles. And so he says, now when the congregation was broken up, uh, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Continue. That's perseverance of the saints. And I'm sorry to bring Calvin into this, but a true child of God, a born-again child of God, will continue in the grace and faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now this is awesome. So not just the Jewish people, and not just the few Gentiles that were there the week before, this time the whole city. When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and spake against these things, which are spoke, spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Now, here's another way to judge where I am in relation to the work and service and ministry of Jesus Christ. Are the people speaking against me driven to blasphemy, or are they correcting me with good doctrine from God's word? That'll let me know where I stand. Uh, they waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should have been first spoken to you, but seeing uh, you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So they continue, and then they say, since the Jewish people don't think they're worthy enough to be saved, at least the Gentiles are selfish enough and scared enough of God's wrath that they will seek God's salvation. And then in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Here's another way to check the fruit of someone who claims to have been converted. Are they glorified or is God and God's word glorified? Jesus said they would receive all manner of people who would come in their own name but it takes a special and converted heart to receive someone who is glorifying the person and work of Jesus Christ and proclaiming the word of God. That's another way to check the conversion of those who claim to be Christians. And then in chapter 14 and verse 8 of Acts, it says, There sat a certain man at Lister, impotent at his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who had never, uh, never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. When the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycania, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. By the way, the whole world is looking for gods to come to earth in the likeness of men. And they're going to get it more than one way. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was a chief speaker. Then the priests of Jupiter, which, is before, uh, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So they're going to make gods uh, of Paul and Barnabas, and they're going to sacrifice to them as gods. Which, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out, and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth, and the sea, and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, and that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And when these things scarce restrained they the people, uh, they had not, that they had not done sacrifice to them. So even after protesting and saying, we're not gods, we're, we're like men unto you, we have uh, passions just like yours, we're just proclaiming to you the true and living God of heaven, they still wanted to do sacrifice, and they hardly left off after Paul and Barnabas protested. There came uh, there certain Jews from Antioch, 
And Lyconian, who persuaded the people, uh, and <laughs> that name is Stone Paul. That's just a little aside. Here he was, he healed a, a, a lame and crippled man. He protested that he and Barnabas were not gods, and for all that trouble he was stoned. Drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit his disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Here's the final uh, for today measure of where I am in the faith, where anyone is in the faith. What kind of opposition are we getting? Are we getting mild opposition? Then perhaps we are lightly esteeming the rock of our salvation. The deeper you get into the person and work of Jesus Christ, his uniqueness, his worthiness alone to be glorified and worshipped, his sufficiency alone in person and uh, accomplishment on the cross and the empty tomb to save men from the destructive uh, wrath of God through faith in him, the deeper you get into that and the more, uh, uh, the more uh, narrow you make the way and the more uh, difficult or straight you make the gate and the more you challenge people to examine themselves and see whether they truly are in the faith and to, uh, oh, what was the other one? Uh, examine yourself, see whether you are in the faith. Uh, well, that's, that's good enough. Uh, and the more unique and the more uh, uh, exclusive you make the gospel of Jesus Christ, the harder and more frequent and more widespread your opposition is going to be. And so I ask myself, uh, how, how, <laughs> how have I been opposed? Not all that much, which makes me think that it's time to do more things like this morning and buckle down and say stuff that's true according to God's word, but that's also worthy of being opposed. Uh, and, and, for, and for us in the workplace, the more you tell people, no, you're not a good person, only Jesus is good, the more you tell people, no, enough good works won't get you into heaven, only the shed blood of Jesus Christ applied to your heart is sufficient for that. The more you tell people no, uh, you ought not to be patted on the back for what you've done, and you're not that good a parent, and you're not that good a spouse, and you're not that good an employee. Uh, I'm turning you to the Lord Jesus Christ to worship, serve, glorify, and give thanks to him alone. And any, any kind of self-introspection, uh, any kind of self a congratulation, any kind of seeking the praise of other men is counter to that, you're going to get some opposition. And I'll tell you from personal experience, when I look in that mirror and I see someone who's not following Jesus the way he should be, who's not uh, humble and repentant for sin as much as he should be, uh, who isn't giving himself to the study of the scriptures as diligently as he should be, who isn't as good a husband as he should be, but wants to be, uh, th the more I realize if it's about any one of us, then it's a lost cause. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. And when we are born again by the Holy Spirit of God, we can say he is the Son of God. Perfect. Sinless. Without, uh, without spot or blemish. Uh, even, even Pontius Pilate, as he handed Jesus over to be crucified, said, I find no fault in this man. I'll do it anyway because I'm scared, but he is innocent. That ought to get us some opposition. If we're doing it right. Now I thank God that we're able to meet and worship freely. I am beyond thankful for that, and I remind myself over and over of John Wesley's words that we will lay no further burden on our brothers since God has blessed them with this strange freedom. And I want that freedom to continue not only as long as I live, but as long as uh, the church is in the world. So that people have a safe place, a place of refuge to come and worship Almighty God the way that he prescribes in his word and according to the dictates of their conscience. But in the meantime, let us be a little more bold and rub people a little more the wrong way with the truth of the counsel of God's word.
no matter what the opposition. And when people claim to have been born again, look at the pattern in life of Paul. Look at the fruit that he produced. Look at his preaching. Look at his work. Look at his service. Look at him wearing himself out for the churches. And say, are those who claim to be born again, including myself, doing anywhere near what he was? Because that's the fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in a man's heart.